What's up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And on The Stack, we talk about a couple of books that come out this week, but also yeah. we are going to talk about some of our best trades of 2021, best graphic novels, best trade collections of runs. Now, if you haven't checked it out already, go and listen to our live show where we counted out our 13 top comic books of top 2020 13. going on. But we are going to talk about some best trades here, things that you should catch up on, maybe you missed during the course of the year. Uh, but first, hey, it's still a regular Wednesday. There Comics are still, are still coming, comic guys. Books it doesn't matter. Coming doesn't, out, so we're the engine talk doesn't about them stop. First. It never stops. Creator, creators keep creating. You know what I'm exactly. talking about? I'm yes. Saying. And I love so to watch it. We're going to kick it off with Timeless, number one, from Marvel, written by Jed McKay, art by Kev Walker, Greg Land, and Jay Leston, Mark Bagley, and Andrew Hennessy. This is the tee-up book for Marvel's big year of comics in 2022, focusing on Kang the Conqueror as he lays out a bunch of teases for the future of the Marvel Universe, as well as a event that we don't know a lot about, but is coming in summer that seems to be called Judgment Day or something like that, possibly has something to do with Avengers versus Eternals. We're not 100% sure. Uh, but, Justin, you're a big fan of Jed McKay. What would you think about this book? Well, let me say, Jed McKay, I feel like, is uh, wrote Black Cat, one of my favorite books of this year, this past year. So definitely check that out if you haven't. Um, but um, I feel like Jed McKay, a rising star at Marvel Comics. Very excited that um, he's writing this book. And this book, I thought, was great. I feel like a lot of these... Books that Marvel does uh, over the past few years where they tee up all their stuff have been very, like, sort of wide-spanning, like, let's just look at the world and, and pop into a bunch of different characters and storylines that we're going to be seeding now and then exploring later. And the fact that this book stood on its own was an awesome story about Kang and this uh, professor that sort of rides along with him. We got to really get into Kang's head. I feel like this is a... I haven't liked Kang nearly as much as I did reading this book. Much more interesting take. And setting up a bunch of stuff, and we should talk about the last page reveal a little bit later because that was crazy to me, uh, but exciting. Yeah. Pete, what's your take? Yeah, this was really cool. I, I very much like this. Uh, I like the whole setup. I feel like they did it in a, cool, uh, in a good way, not in an annoying way. Um, I, you know, the kind of like, villain reveal was badass i didn't like what kind of like happened uh at the end uh but or towards the end but man just really some cool badass stuff um yeah i i was really impressed with this a lot of great great things between this and death of dr strange jen mckay is doing a good job of yes. writing events that have fun, twisty, focused kickoffs, to your point, Justin. And unique where, uh, across. Yeah. It, it, it's something that feels like, oh, okay, I do actually want to read more about this versus where this is just the first issue kicking off a million different spinoffs. And that, mind you, is what it's doing, but he still manages to tell a story within the pages of the comic, which is great. Um, there's one thing, and this has nothing to do with the writing team. This is just a weird sticking point with me with Marvel. Given the fact that we know Jonathan Majors is Kang in the MCU, it's crazy to me that they haven't just made Kang, Kang maybe the easiest character to retcon into looking like Jonathan Majors, that they haven't just done that. That like yeah. The fact that he still looks like this generic white dude who might as well be a jacked Tony Stark. 100%. I, 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 I don't know. And I'm just like, also, the way he looks now, I'm like, this is Vandal Savage from the DC Universe. I'm like, yes. we don't want that either. Like, just, I 100% agree, super easy to do that. But it's something, Marvel's picky about it. They don't do that. And I'm just like, we all want it. The fact that they did that with uh, Nick Fury and were super yeah. weird about that. It was this whole, Well, like, they're still super son. weird about that. Every time he yeah. shows up, people would be like, I'm very clear. I, I'm Nick Fury Jr. Yeah. And it's just like, get out <laughs> of here. Like, Nobody doesn't matter. Wants that. Who cares? Nobody wants that. Yeah. Just fix it. And that's why I want to say so much of, the, much of this stuff. Just fix it. Like, we don't yeah. tell, tell a good story. Fix it. Totally. So let's talk about the end of the book. There's a big spoiler here, but there is a biographer who is going along with Kang throughout the issue. And in the last page of the issue, he reveals something that is in his notes and is the symbol for Miracle Man, 
the character. Uh, I don't know if it was created I mean, created by Alan Moore or I guess revamped by Alan Moore uh, and then famously written by him, partially written by Neil Gaiman as well. Um, there was a very convoluted history there. Marvel came into possession of Miracle Man and have kind of sat on the property for a while. It seems like they're actually bringing him back in some way. Maybe he is the person behind this event. What do you think, Justin? Well, I, I, I'm just curious. It's a big drop. Because that's something, a Miracle Man, great story. Uh, like, those issues are super interesting. Maybe that's something, in light of this, we should cover. Uh, I feel like we've never really talked about that, maybe, as a group. Mm-hmm. But m- the most news about Miracle Man has just been the litigation surrounding it for decades at this point. So I'm very curious how if they're trying to integrate Miracle Man into the Marvel Universe, that feels like a little weird. It feels very much like inserting Dr. Manhattan into the DC universe. In a Which very we similar, was also weird. Yeah. It was also weird. I, I can see them heading towards a place where they're like, this uh, multiversal catastrophe that's coming is because Miracle Man takes over the Marvel universe. And maybe they get Neil Gaiman to come back and write it. I guess that's a possibility. That's something that can make it worth it. Certainly some of the stuff they've done with the Watchmen characters post Alan Moore has not been bad. I know that sounds like fade praise, but yep. uh, I think it could have gone wrong in multiple ways. And certainly it has gone wrong occasionally, but not always same thing with miracle man. I just also don't know that there's the same level of affection or knowledge of miracle man. Other there than is not core comic. Book I, I, I think yeah. there is not <laughs> very, very I, clear. I was very confused by the end because we had this amazing you know, this, tell me to spoil the book here, but we had this amazing reveal of Reed Richards as Dr. Doom. I thought, holy shit, this is so badass. And then you have this no-name nerdy guy stab him through the back and then do the Mr. Miracle symbol. Like, I, I was just really upset by the stab through the back moment. It really bothers me when, like, no name characters take out legends and uh oh man it it just really threw me out of it and the mm reveal was like uh, i just didn't think it was it went from being like holy shit to no oh, uh. it's the the thing about miracle man and there's ways of making the story work if it works that's great but it feels to me about this thing that, and we talked about this in the live show, we've been doing the show for 15 years, but I feel like I'm beating the same drum, which is like, stop appealing to a smaller, more insular audience. Stop just appealing to comic book fans with this stuff, because the possibility of what Miracle Bad could do, exciting potentially, but it's not the same sort of like mic drop that it is for an outside audience as it is for an inside audience. Yeah. And Marvel should be aiming wider with these reveals, particularly, particularly with Kang. Like we're talking about being a character on Loki, Kang being a character in Ant-Man, Kang potentially being like the biggest player in the MCU right now, maybe going forward, do something that makes people go, Oh shit. Oh, I got to read this. I have never read a comic book before, but I want to pick this up. Instead of people our age being like, ah, yes, Miracle Man, that was a good comic book. I'm excited to see what his further adventures are. Yeah, exactly. Well, and plus, like, people will, you know, hardcore, there may be a handful of hardcore Kang fans, whoever, I don't know who they are, who are going to be like, hey, that's not the Kang that I know. They're called Kangaroos, by the way. That's the fan based name, but go ahead. (laughs) The rules are going to be up in arms, and yeah. um, but like if the if you make d- the Jonathan Majors Kang and add make him the Marvel Universe comic universe Kang, like they might be like, hey, wait, it's just like they will come on. The other people that you're putting a barrier up to for them to enjoy this, those people won't come in, and it's just that's they're just making the wrong choice. Yeah, and again, I don't put any of this on the creative team for this book, which I do think was a good book. This is more talking yes. about the overall universe. Overall universe. Let's move forward, though, and well, talk about... I, s- yeah, go ahead. I was the only one bothered by that fucking backstabbing. I, I liked mean, it. it was an, yeah, it was an alternate universe, Reed Richards, who had gem eyes and was Dr. Doom, so it didn't bother me as much. 
Jam eyes are watching you. I liked it. I thought it was a cool the implications for what the Kang walked away with from there. I thought it was cool. Is is Kang truly this like ultimate human, or yeah, is he just like, a guy you're making excuses? Me to believe that Reed Richards, who is now Doom and has gem eyes, is not going to fucking factor in the fucking doofus with the giant spear behind him. Like, I, oh. it was another Reed who's been on a alternate Earth with nobody else for. Decades, maybe. He's insane. It's hard to see through gem eyes, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. She's got Let's, gem eyes. I love that song. Watch they got to play that song on the radio more. It's really good. <laughs> Swamp Thing, Greed Hell, number one from DC Comics, written by Jeff Lemire, art by Doug Mankey. This is a post-apocalyptic book where most of the world has been covered in water, except for at least one small island, maybe more, but we don't so know. So, two. Yeah, and the rot, the green, and the red all team up to take out the remaining humans so they could restart the world and get things back to normal, and it turns into a straight-up horror movie book. Pete, I know you don't like scary things, but you do like Swamp Things sometimes, so how did you feel about this? I feel like this was a solid first issue. I love the character reveal at the end. That got me very excited. I feel like this is some great... Of course it did. uh, Great art. Um... I it just I was like really enjoying this kind of like slow start and this build and then when the bugs started talking and the floating heads I kind of got pulled out of it a little bit uh but I'm excited to see where this is going I think Jeff Lemire, I talked about this on the live show, Jeff Lemire is having a moment right now. I think he's such a tactician in the way that he writes and chooses his stories and moments and this book I thought was excellent. A uh, great Swamp Thing story where you're sort of like shifting sides. There's a, sw- a Swamp Thing and then there's the Swamp Thing. Great reveal later on. Definitely looking forward to the second. It, it, is this a two-part? I'm imagining this is a two-part story. I don't know why, but uh, definitely looking forward to the next issue. And it is a black label book, so it's pretty hardcore, just so everybody knows. Next up, Stray Dogs, Dog Days, number one from Image Comics, written by Tony Fleeks, art by Tris Forstner. This is an anthology book set in the world of Stray Dogs, which is about a bunch of dogs whose masters were killed by a serial killer, and then they were taken in by him. Over the course of Stray Dogs, they helped figure out the mystery. Um, and they solved the, the case! And they solved the case! Dog dogs. solving a case. Amazing. Dog solved the case. What a great book. Pete loves it. Uh, Alex, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so this is some of these stories take place before they were taken, some while they were taken, some after they were taken. I thought this was great. I thought this was such a good, so good. extension of... The Brad, to use an absolutely terrible term. Yep. Straight but, up, Brad. Yes, yeah, absolutely terrible. Uh, but I love the variety of stories here. That Some were funny. Some were very sad. Some yeah. were scary. Really good. But and, and it uh, that when we had um, Tony on the show, he talked about how like he wanted to have this Friday. And these are the first five. There's one more issue coming out where we get the second five, I believe. Um, and... It's great. Um, and let me ask you, Pete, I know you're down on stray dogs. Um, if it was stray cats, would you enjoy it more? No, no, I wouldn't. There's but cats you like in cats. this issue. There's uh, cats yes, in this I issue. Did you cats. like the, seeing dogs. the cat? That was a this cat story was sad. It's super sad. They're, so they're, they, kind of, they kind of get you with this. There's this one story where the dog calls the guy a monster, and you think, oh, God, this is going to be the worst person ever, but it's like monster in a good way or whatever and so that was kind of like oh maybe it's this nice. isn't gonna fucking rip off my rip out my heart but then later it really does the the problem with this is it's the uh, and i say the problem with this um they're doing this thing where they're giving you the most cute adorable dogs possible and then telling some really fucked up dark twisted stories um and uh yeah i mean Cool if you're into it. 100%. And we, and we are all into it, is what Pete's saying. Definitely pick it up. Uh, a trio with one mind. Devil's Reign, number two from Marvel, <laughs> written by Chip Zdarsky, art by Marco Cicchetto. In this book, the Marvel Universe, at least the parts in New York, are being assaulted by the Kingpin, who has made all masks illegal. He has sent a bunch of supervillains who are working, after, working for him. After every hero in New York, he's taking away their powers, throwing them in jail. He's also chopped up the purple man, stole his finger, and put it in his gen cane. 
uh, in order to do a classic <laughs> Emperor Doom move and take over New York. This is so much bigger than I expected and I so it. much less Daredevil than I expected. But it's got – it's all across – it's a secret great crossover with like a ton of – we get a ton of great Luke Cage here. Pete, Luke Cage running for um, mayor. They really yeah. power up the mayor of New York as a <laughs> big power player <laughs> in the Marvel <laughs> Universe. Um, so I think that's, that's fun. It's a great wide story. All the characters are great. I feel like one of, the one thing that I'll wait. mention and then I'll let you talk about it, Pete, is just on the mayor of New York thing. I feel like if this was a little truer to the mayor of New York, there needs to be a lot more like, you suck. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> Nobody hey, cares. Hey, my subway was late, Kingpin. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, I just think this is like the best Marvel crossover that nobody's talking about. I think uh, that this is a, a about. really... Shut the fuck up and let me talk. Um, I, I really think this is a very cool way of kind of like getting a bunch of characters together. I really think the art's fantastic. A lot of over-the-top shit. I'm, I'm loving the fact that each issue we're spending it with different people. Love the Taskmaster stuff in this, the Luke Cage stuff. This is some really cool shit that they're setting it up. Uh, with this little mini event, and uh, I'm having a blast. I, uh, yeah, I, I think this is really, really well done. Pete, what do you think about the fact that Luke Cage is probably going to be the next mayor of New York in the Marvel Universe? Well, and the real universe. Yeah, mm. I mean, you know, like it really is, is you know, we, it, it, the pendulum swings. So I think that's an interesting choice to have fo- Luke Cage follow Kingpin. Um, and I think that, like, That'll be real cool to see what Luke Cage does. Are you going to move back to New York now that um, now that he's running for office? Oh, I've thought about it, yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely thinking about it, for sure. The Human Target, number three from DC Comics, written by Tom King, art by Greg Smallwood. In this issue, the Human Target has one less day to live and is spending most of it going up against Guy Gardner, who's pissed off that he is spending time with his girlfriend, uh, Ice, uh, this book is great. I really like this book a lot. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I, it, Tom King. Cre- oh, you can go, Pete. I I really think this is amazing art. Uh, I love to see uh, someone beating up a lan- lantern. That's really fun. Uh, love the panels. Uh, this is a tight package. This is a really cool story. Uh, well done. Tight package. Uh, I think yeah. Tom King does an amazing job of creating recency bias. I feel like I'm like this is the Tom King book that is best. Uh, every book, I, at some yeah, point, I'm like, like this oh, is no, the one. This is the best one. Yeah. And, and this one, it like beautiful art. Like you're just like caught up in this sort of like romance. Also, like just a w- triangle with Guy Gardner. Awesome. You then you get some triangle. like hard DC continuity with Booster Gold, a Legionnaire ring or Legion ring, uh, Green Lantern. Like it's just like he's just he's just a master right now. Yeah. And I I know I'm really like showing myself off here too much. And I know I said this with the last issue as well, but this might be like Greg Smallwood's art. The way that he draws those scenes with ice are so romantically tense. Yeah. You know, just like there's moments like when she leaves him at the door. Uh, If I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. (laughs) I know. I was like, I'm. I'm like, come on, man, go talk to her. Okay, I, I'm on, caught up on. in it. I'm, yes. I feel like a teenager. I feel like a teenager Absolutely. like on a date, just like trying to like fall in love. And let's all fall in love. Pete, fall in love. Alex is in love. I'm in love. I'm in love with a girl named Ice. I'm in love with a girl named Ice. <laughs> and she's cold at heart and nice. Right, Pete? <laughs> Pete? I could do this all day. <laughs> oh, yes. Feel free to come into the mic whenever you want. Uh, Power <laughs> Rangers Universe Number One from Boob Studios, written by Nicole Andelfinger, illustrated by Simone Ragazzoni. In this uh, issue, it takes place mostly in the far future, where some astronaut has been trapped in the Morphin Grid. And Are you talking about the, the Morphin future? <laughs> You're talking oh, about yeah. the far Morphin Here's the future. Thing. This is not my wheelhouse. This is not my wheelhouse, but I always like checking out a first issue of a Power Rangers comic, particularly because the Boom Studios stuff has been very good and involving, even though I mostly don't care about it. Uh, what do you guys think about this one, though? 
I, I think this is cool. I mean, we don't really get to see them, like, all suited up. Like, this is kind of starting with them kind of, like, depowered and figuring stuff out. But I think it's a solid first issue, amazing art. You get to really spend some time with the characters before we're getting into, like, action and stuff like that. So you get kind of a real uh, pulse check of, like, what's going on, who, what different people are up to and what they're thinking uh, yeah, and then kind of the big reveal of like where they are and all the shit going down. So, uh, yeah, I think this is a solid first issue. A lot of these Power Rangers books are doing a lot of work to create a full on like mythology around this, and like cool. But I feel like the actual Mighty Morphin Power Rangers were created over someone's lunch. Where they were like, yeah, Morphin Power Rangers. Put them in suits, helmets, so we can change the actors out in case one of them gets too old or weird. And then we'll just keep it going, okay? And that's literally what the TV show was. And then this book has to be like, so the um, Morphin Energy Portal is, we have to make sure that it's, it like, has to, like, develop all this stuff out of something that is not even, Morphin is short for morphing. Not <laughs> something else. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you there, but at the same time, I do think they do a good job in 100%, this book, particularly 100%. the idea that there's some sort of demonic being trapped inside of this morphing grid and is getting out along with this glowing astronaut. It's weird. It's creepy. It's interesting. Um, the, like you're saying, there's a lot of work that's going on here to make it realistic and grounded, but I think it's successful, which is impressive. I look forward to them getting into the Repulsa clan and how um, their oh, yeah. deck decades of evil have re- allowed to them to come to their Rita <laughs> Repulsa. Who no, no, this. Repulsa is my family name. That is why I am called that. It has been passed down through generations. DC versus Vampires, number three from DC Comics, written by James Tide of the Fourth and Matthew Rosenberg, art by Otto Schmidt. In this issue, the vampires make some big moves to take down our DC heroes and villains. Everybody is very unsure of each other, whether they are vampires or not, and some big characters go out. Pete... Talk about this one. Well, you got Bergy and JT4 on this, so this is just crazy fun. I mean, you know, I don't like uh, a little bit of the, you know, as you mentioned, Alex, a little bit of the lying, the little back and forth here of who's a vamp, who's not. You don't Uh, like lying? Yeah, I don't like lying. But you like vampires. uh, I think this is a great premise. Who said it? Unbelievable team, great art. Uh, I think this is very cool. I'm. I would thought this was going to be a lot more eye rolly, uh, but it's been it's been very enjoyable. It's my pick of the week. I thought this is such a this book is so fun, so good, beautiful art. The, we were talking about the the panels um, up in Human Target number three a minute ago. The panel where um, Green Lantern is with Wonder Woman and um, it, light spoiler here, like about to maybe bite her neck. I was like, yeah. "This, I'm blushing, I'm blushing." Like, yeah, it got a, yeah, it was, uh, it was intense. Yeah, it's great, great stuff. Let's move on. Talk about Ice Cream Man number twenty seven from Image Comics, written by W. Maxwell Prince, art by Martin Morasso. In this issue, we're getting a riff on Metamorphosis, except in reverse. A cockroach turns into a man here, and we find out what it's like to be a man when you're a bug. Um, another great we're issue. Also of what it's ice- like to be a bug. You know, and live and a man. With two other exactly. bugs in a box. You Aren't know, we all three bugs? bugs in a box uh, is how my that's life us. is. Mm-hmm. That's us. And, We're the bugs. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, Pod- what's podcasts nice, is good. I always say. Well, mm. what's what's heartbreaking is those cockroaches were nicer to each other than the life that I live in my box, but. <laughs> You know, it gives me hope for the future. (laughs) What? (laughs) This book gives you hope for the future? Pete, you want crumbs? You want crumbs, Pete? I do want crumbs. Are are you you the cockroach that becomes a a man? I don't know. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) This book, amazing. Another great story um, from from the Ice Cream Man universe. It's just... It's, it feels like we're getting it, it, this similar things, but told in new ways every time. It's great. It's very creative. It's very different. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, you the, each one of these, you don't know what you're walking into. So it's impressive all the different ways that they're coming about stuff. 
Action Comics number 1038 from DC Comics, written by Philip Kennedy Johnson and Sean Aldridge, art by Miguel Mendoza and Adriana Mello. We are continuing the War World saga here after Superman and his allies were beaten by Mongol. They are thrown into slave pits. Superman is beaten down. And I'll tell you what, I know exactly where this story is going. And I think we all knew exactly where this story was going from the very first issue, but I love it. And I love how hard Philip Kennedy Johnson is driving in on. Yeah. I've got to knock to super bad as far down as possible. And then yeah. he's going to triumph by just being the best guy anyway. It's a good guy. Oh my God. It gets like me every time. Like he's a good guy. He's like a Superman. Mm-hmm. Like he were boiling it down to the basics. <laughs> He's a super guy, man. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. like a man who's super. I get what you're saying. No, uh, this is super great, though. good. This is great. I agree. Uh, and I actually really like that we're not using because this could easily have been the Justice League story with Batman in the Midnighter spot um, that we get in this issue, and it's not. And I like that it's not um, because it feels more unique. Uh, and the stuff when Superman is fully beaten down, he's talking about his son. Um, in, in the middle of the book here, it's just it's just great. It's emotional. He finds the core that makes it. Even though, to Alex's point, we know where this is going, he still finds the real core to keep the story different. I tell you, I I don't know where this is going, but man, this is just like this Mongol fight world is crazy. This is such an interesting. <laughs> Uh, like to see, uh, as they said, blue uh, down and out like this. Uh, such a cool idea. Such an interesting setup. This is some badass shit. And it's like got me being like, oh, man, I don't know if Superman's going to be able to pull this off, but I really hope he does. <laughs> it's a great action themed comic featuring a Superman. Hmm. Huh. Uh, good point. Once in Future, number 23 from Boob Studios, written by Kieran Gillen, art by Dan Amora. In this issue, stories are assaulting England. Lots of stuff are going on with our main characters, but mostly our granny and her grandson <laughs> are tracking down a new legend that is revealed at the end that I'm sure Justin was very interested in. Uh, but Pete... Uh, you seem to like this book. What did you think about this issue? I mean, come on, man. It starts off with Granny and the sniper scope, like crosshairs, not sweating it a bit. Uh, bluffing through Classic her granny. teeth. Just being a badass. This is just over the top. I mean, you know, what a reimagining of Jack and the Beanstalk. Like, this is just creative, <laughs> over the top, fantastic badass cool just uh, the adjectives bananas yeah might i say the best reimagining since brian singer's jack the giant slayer <laughs> <laughs> wow Don't. well let me say um i'm here for the shakespeare stuff the reveal at the end i'm right there put it in but let the jack and the beanstalk stuff i was like nope Wrong. This feels wrong here. Like, we're doing Shakespeare. We're doing Arthurian legend. Why are you doing fairy tale stuff? Go read fables. The Jack of the Stuff, I was like, feels like a bridge too far for this book. Weird. We all have our things. And one of the things that we have is this week's sponsor, which is the Blindsided Podcast for the Players' Tribune. Given how they play the game, you might not think that professional athletes are dealing with mental health issues, but that's exactly what the Players' Tribune is tackling with their first ever mental health podcast, Blindsided. Hosted by former NHL goalie Corey Hirsch and psychiatrist Dr. Diane McIntosh, the show will share the moments for a variety of athletes when everything changed for them and mental health became the most important focus of their lives. Blindsided allows listeners to have an understanding of the different types of mental health challenges people face, whether you're a professional athlete or not. Guests this season's include Kevin Love, Paul Bissonette, and Kurt Warner. Blindsided dives in deeper, it gets clinical, and it allows listeners to leave with an understanding of the different varieties of mental health challenges people face, uh, why they appear, and why athletes in particular face them down. Blindsided is a sports podcast, not only for people who follow sports, but also for those who don't. All right, and now we are going to move to the second part of our podcast and talk about some of our favorite trades of the year. Now, I mentioned these are in no particular order, 
These are just some trades that we thought uh, we would like to highlight. I don't think there's anything that is duplicative necessarily from our best comics uh, of the year list. Uh, and in fact, we moved some things over here, which we felt like yeah. were great, but we wanted to put on the trades anyway. So why don't we kick it off with Far Sector from DC Comics, written by N.K. Jemison, art by Jamal Campbell. Pete, hit us up. So this is groundbreaking. You know, we talk about why you would put... <laughs> Something on a list. What makes things stand out? Here we have Green Lantern. You love Nobody Green can. Lantern. Just shut up. I'm talking. So Green Lantern dead. I don't care about Green Lantern anymore. I've been played out. The fucking comics go back. There's so much lore. There's so much. Th- it's almost too much to get into. It's too intimidating. To fucking like you got to know who everybody is and all this stuff. That's happened before. Here is a fresh start, a fresh take on a on a, a character that not a lot of people like. Um, and so just I'm so impressed with what they did here. Took somebody like me who doesn't want anything to do with Green Lantern. Be excited about Green Lantern again. The art, so creative, so different from anything we've seen when it comes to Green Lantern. This is groundbreaking stuff. You've got to check this out. Far sector, far and above any other things this year that I wanted to talk about, really did something magical and fantastic in comics. So just to mention the concept of the book, the idea is that a rookie lantern is said to the far sector of the title, ends up investigating a murder there that uh, explodes into a giant conspiracy. But if you've read any of any K. Jeminson stuff, you probably know that there's a lot of very big very weird sci fi ideas that are in there with this planet, including living memes in a society of their own, among other things. Um but like uh, Pete mentioned the main character is great. The art by Jamal Campbell is great. Uh, you know, I know this is not always possible, but it's wonderful that the same team was on the title for all 12 yeah. issues. And I believe you can get a volume with all 12 issues in it. So uh, this is a great story to just read in one sitting if you can. 100% agree. And Green Lantern famously the only comic book character with too much history to catch up on. <laughs> the Good Asian from Image Comics, written by Pornsack Pinnashad, art by Alexandra Tfingi and Lee Lowridge. This is a great mystery that recasts a lot of the classic, very racist movies that you might know about yeah. involving Asian detective characters and instead delves into it in a more realistic way in the, I probably have the time period wrong, but 1940s slash 50s. Um, and uh, it's just a really, really good noir with some beautiful art. Uh, and I believe the first volume is available now. Uh, I mean, yeah. I agree. Like, able to dive in and out of a lot of different stories um, throughout uh, throughout the first volume. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I really appreciate what this comic is doing. It, it's not only just, like, groundbreaking, but it's it's also just, like, talking about fucked up history and doing it in a smart way. And I, I, it's just some amazing storytelling with some fantastic art that just pulls you into this world and, and takes you on a journey. Let's get to our Tom King block. Now, as Justin mentioned earlier in the podcast, every Tom King book feels like the best Tom King book. But two great Tom King books came out this year that you can read in full in trade collection volumes. Rorschach from DC Comics, written by Tom King, art by Jorge Fornes. And the other one is Strange Adventures, written by Tom King, art by Mitch Drods and Evan Doc Sheener. The first one, as we were kind of talking about towards the beginning of the podcast, is one of the good ones, taking for the Watchmen characters, picking up yep. 35 years later and having a detective involve a mystery that involves a Rorschach conspiracy, among other things. And the second one is a recasting in the DC universe of Adam Strange and his wife, as we explore what happened back on the planet Ron, as well as on Earth, as they show up there without their daughter. Adam Strange has written a book. So two very, very different mysteries with very different art teams. But uh, talk about these books, guys. Uh, Rorschach, I feel like great, like sort of mystery box story, trying to figure out what happened, how we got where we are. And then touching on a lot of sort of zeitgeisty politics through the lens of comic book characters, conspiracy theory, 
uh, believing in different things, why people sort of uh, end up where they end up and what takes them there. And then Strange Adventures feels like sort of the what war does to people, what trauma does to people, something Tom King has been playing with a lot lately. And jumping back and forth between like um, Adam Strange, an unreliable narrator, and then um, uh, Mr. Terrific sort of on the case as like a sort of A-plus good boy, I always get the job done. Uh, Hero, just he, he just gets, Tom King gets just so specific, and he always brings in great artists to work with. Pete nods in agreement. Let's move on to one that I'm sure I'll have more words about. Beta Ray Bill, Argent Star from Marvel by Daniel Warren Johnson. This is a book that Daniel Warren Johnson did both the writing and the art on. We had him on the show to talk about this very book. So go back and check out the live show about that. But this is a solo adventure with Beta Ray Bill as he tries to get his mojo back in classic awesome okay. powers okay. fashion. Pete, take it away. Yeah, I mean, this is just uh, a badass marriage of writing and art and this kind of like over the top, but also heartfelt uh, story of Beta Ray Bill and his personal uh, struggles with his appearance, Uh, uh, you know, maybe oblivious to love that is right in front of him, but really just unbelievable, uh, just comic uh, I mean, the paneling alone that you get to see in the spaceship and all the cool stuff. There's just little treasures in every kind of corner. Uh, Yeah, this is just a really impressive package. You should check it out. Yeah, love Danny Warren Johnson. I'm a big fan of his book, Murder Falcon. Huh. Yeah, I, I think I actually introduced the podcast to Murder Falcon. If oh, I correctly. you guys are hilarious. <laughs> Real hilarious. Pete's Let's wearing an I dislike Murder Falcon. <laughs> that is not what I'm wearing. Why did you oh. get that made, Pete? It's terrible. I can't believe you made your own shirt about how you dislike Murder Falcon. That's <laughs> no, not true. It's the opposite of what's true. Bar Bailey and Red Planet from Dark Horse Comics, written by Tate Bromble, art by Gabriel Hernandez Walta. This takes place in the Black Hammer universe and uh, focuses on the Martian Manhunter esque character, goes through two timelines, shows what happened to him back on Mars, which was very traumatic, and also in the present day, at least for him, as he investigates a mystery and deals with the fact that he is gay. Uh, and. Uh, this is great. This book is yeah. absolutely fantastic. But I also think I've seen this on a lot of best graphic novel lists. We were talking about this a little bit before we were taping. But the <clears throat> excuse me, the whole Black Hammer universe has been so fantastic this year. Yeah. But it sometimes can feel a little daunting to get into. This is one that is a complete story that is excellent quality that you need no prior knowledge of Black Hammer can jump right into and understand the emotion and the art involved in it uh, without having to delve into the entire Black Hammer universe. Though, that said, you definitely should because it's all quality regardless. Yeah, Black Hammer Visions as well. Very good standalone stories in the same universe. But this book, I agree, super great, uh, great art. Let's move on and talk about Berserker from Boom Studios, written by Keanu Reeves and Matt Kent, art by Ron Garney. In this book, an immortal warrior played by a guy who looks very similar to some actor that I can't put my finger on. Sandra Bullock. Uh, as, as Sandra Bullock uh, from The Lake House has battled throughout time and keeps getting brought back over and over again. He delves into his origins. He delves into his future. Pete, I know you love this book. Want to talk about it? Yeah, I mean, we've seen kind of versions of this, but this was just a really impressive telling of this story. Uh, Keanu Reeves, you know, bringing uh, something a little extra to this project. Uh, Garney's art, unbelievable. So it just explores it and goes a little bit deeper than you think. And it's it's really impressive what they do in this book. Um, you think it's just going to be about a rage monster, but it's it's, it's so much more. And it's, uh, it's impressive what it's done and um, uh, got some uh, claim for it. So we wanted to give it a shout out. I agree. It's so much better than um, I expected based on the premise. It's really smart and just exploring this idea to its fullest. 
I would say, though, that the real hero of this book is Ron Garney, whose art is absolutely brutal throughout, absolutely gorgeous. Like the writing, Matt Kint is always great as a writer. Um, Keanu Reeves loved his runs on Green Lantern, and I think he did it for a little while in Justice League International as well. Uh, yep. But Ron Garney is really the true hero here, as I always Keanu- say. Keanu did the art on um, Hush, the the big uh, Batman crossover, right? Yeah, it was uh, Jeff Loeb and Keanu Reeves on art. Uh, okay, let me move on to talk about Bliss from Image Comics, written by Sean Lewis, art by Caitlin Yarsky. This was, I think, one of our favorite books that we talked about on the stack over the past year. It takes place in a world where there is a... I don't even want to call it a drug, but a chemical called bliss that everybody takes that removes all of their bad memories. We explore this through the lens of a trial where a son is trying to uh, expunge his father's name. It gets much deeper than that, gets into gods and weird creatures. But the world building for Sean Lewis is, as always, reliably great. But Caitlin Narsty's art and layouts are Absolutely stunning throughout. Um, This is one that is well worth searching out in trade. Yeah, it's just super creative. You kind of think you understand what's happening, and then it just makes eight more twists. It's really, really impressive storytelling, and it meets uh, magical art and uh, forms together in this crazy uh, book. Definitely worth checking out. Magical art. Let's talk about The Immortal Hulk from Marvel, written by Al Ewing, art by Joe Bennett. Now, uh, I'll be honest with you. This is one of my favorite books of the past couple of years. It has been marred. Sublot is probably an understatement by the fact that Joe Bennett seemingly snuck some anti-Semitic art and symbols into uh, the work. Al Ewing has posted a very public note about it. It really bums me out that the hard work that Al Ewing and everybody else has done was hurt by these circumstances. Uh, But I still think, regardless of all of that, I would say it's still worth checking out as one of the best Hulk runs of all time. Specifically, I believe the fourth volume and maybe the third omnibus were released this year with probably more to come, because I don't think that necessarily covers the end of the run. Um, But great, great run. If you can push past what Joe Bennett did, um, I think it's worth checking out for everybody else's work and supporting it. Yeah, leaving that uh, that aside, um, it's one of the books. I feel like there are, there are some books that just like change the comic industry, like um, the Fraction uh, Hawkeye run. Hawkeye. And this is another one that I feel like put a lot of horror back into comics to mainstream superhero comics in a great way and just allowed people to take more risks with um, sort of the look of different of the book. And uh, I really like the book. Yeah. All right. Before we wrap up here, we've got three graphic novels that Pete wanted to highlight uh, that yeah. have come out this year. So I'll tee them up for you, Pete. And then if you want to talk about them for a little bit, the first one is Monsters from Fantagraphics by Barry Windsor Smith. Hit us up about that one. Well, yeah, so he's been working on this for like 35 years. It's this really kind of interesting... We've been doing this podcast for 15 years. I just want to mention, like not to... Yeah, so we're working hard, too. (laughs) It's kind of this look at monsters and trauma and all sorts of other things, but it's... uh, it's it's a very very interesting, very kind of fucked up, but also great uh, uh, book. It's very powerful and meaningful, and and uh, definitely worth uh, kind of checking out. Next up, Wake: The Hidden History of the Women Led Slave Revolts from Simon and Schuster, written by Rebecca Hall, art by Hugo Martinez. Yeah, I mean, this is just kind of like. Uh, Powerful stuff. It kind of starts off with this kind of uh, woman waking up from this kind of thing um, about her ancestors and what they've been through and kind of like how she kind of relates and and, and kind of uh, uh, moves forward with this information. It's There's so many layers to it, but it's also kind of like really powerful very moving also there's a lot of heart and beauty in it it's uh it's very cool and uh you know it's definitely definitely worth checking out and last but not least certainly run book one from abram's books written by john lewis and andrew aiden art by l fury and nate powell yeah uh you know rest in peace uh john lewis um yeah this is, uh, you know, the kind of tagline is first you march, then you run. 
Um, and it's this kind of uh, look at, uh, you know, history and for there to be ch uh, change, there needs to be pushback and hard conversations. And this is just a very, very powerful book uh, and graphic novel form that hopefully uh, a bunch of people will check out and, and look into. All right, there you go. Those are some of, not all of, but some of the best trade collections and graphic novels of the year. Definitely check them out. Sure, there are lots of other ones that we missed. Certainly, when we were putting together our best comics list, there were a ton of things that we needed to cut off. Check out comicbookclublive.com. We'll put up our individual lists there with plenty more choices that do have trade collections out now that you can check out. You can get caught up on list of the holidays or four. Get go, caught uh, up! Come on! Come on, it's time. Before new comics come out, got to read the old comics. And if you would like to support the show, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Crowdcast on YouTube. Come hang out. We would love to talk to you about comic books, iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe and listen to the show at Comic Book Live on Twitter, comicbookclublive.com, as I mentioned, uh, for this podcast and many more. Until next time and next year, we'll see you at the comic book shop. Happy New Year. All 2021 comics vanish at midnight on December 31st. Oh, no. They sit on crappy couches and they let